Thank you very much, Graham, for inviting me along and also to Nancy. Um, and thank you to you all for being here. Um, I'm going to, to start my presentation today by apologising, even though my mother told me never ever to start anything by apologising. Um, I have two things I want to apologise about in advance. The first thing is, this is my very, very first keynote. So, I may be a little more nervous than usual, and I may read a few more notes than usual, but please bear with me as on my, my very first keynote journey. Second, I need to own up to uh, my own disciplinary background. Um, I do have a background in studio practice, although it probably doesn't look like uh, what many of you have, have experienced um, physically or, um, <laughs> or anyway, pedagogically in some respects. So um, during university, I had certain uh, career aspirations, as you can see here. Um, which led me to spend many hours in rooms like this, um, only generally smaller and pokier and distinctly less fun. Uh, we'd cram in one, two, three, sometimes students, and one or two teachers into this, this small space. Um, to a lesser degree, my image of studio looks like this. Um, both of these spaces were called studios, and as with many of your disciplines, they were essential to my experiential learning and development as a creative practitioner. Through my studio learning experiences and reflections on those studio learning experiences, I ultimately decided to pursue a career in academia instead. So my current position is, this is a mouthful, Vice-Chancellor's -Chan Research Fellow in the Creative Workforce Program of the ARC Centre of Excellence in Creative Industries and Innovation at Queensland University of Technology. <laughs> yes. Which is kind of odd um, to have such a very long title and affiliation when all of my research and my teaching work is about these two seemingly simple questions. What makes creative people successful? And what does this mean for higher education? So in my work, I conduct empirical investigations into creative careers. So career patterns, career outcomes, trajectories, graduate capabilities, and what effective education in, for development of those capabilities usually can look like. I was actually quite anxious in preparing this presentation, um, partly because my studios might not look like some of your studios, and partly because I've never given a keynote presentation before. I was, I was anxious that I wouldn't have anything meaningful to share with you all. But anyway, um, I'm going to share with you a snippet of my fellowship research, which involves in-depth, um, multi-method case studies of outstandingly successful creatives. Um, they're early to mid-career Australian creatives. So the central question I wanted to answer was what skills, capabilities, mindsets, characteristics have a role in making these practitioners the successes that they are. So my participants were 10 um, creatives from the disciplines that you see on the slide here. They'd all been nationally and internationally recognised in a formal way by their disciplines. They maintained successful careers in those disciplines. They were five to ten years out from graduation, and they were all Australian. The reason that I chose five to ten years out is because I wanted them to have some kind of recollection of their uh, higher education experiences and be able to, to link their career development with those experiences. Just for good measure, I did another seven case studies, this with um, outstandingly successful STEM practitioners. I wanted to do some comparative work here. I won't talk so much about them here today, but I just wanted to mention that I did that work as well. Okay, so let's start the discussion of findings with a quote from one of my participants. Hmm. This statement was taken from an, an early interview with one of the participants in my study. It intrigued me. I'd always assumed that disciplinary expertise was of prominent importance to creative career success. So why was this person apparently doing better than his better skilled and maybe even more talented peers? Okay, this is the short answer. I'm going to give you the short answer today. It's, it involves these three concepts. There's a very much longer story 
um, some of which involve um, background and contextual influences that we as educators don't have an awful lot of control over. Um, for instance, it seems to be a distinct advantage to be quite tall and quite good looking. <laughs> And it also helps to have uh, a partner who is prepared to support you financially as you're starting out and then um, swap over and take over most of the domestic responsibilities once you're established. But I'm not going to talk about those. Instead, I'm going to talk about these capabilities which appear to be developable through higher education programs. Okay, first, social networking capability. A really striking fact um, that, that I, I found in my study was that none of the participants worked in isolation. They'd been recognised individually, but they were usually just the most visible person in a passionate team of creative collaborators, backers, business partners, agents, mentors, and so on. What the participants were saying about the importance of their working relationships reminded me of Erica McWilliam's work, um, her notion of flocking for creativity, that a group of creative people can actually fly higher and faster than an individual flying by themselves, in the same way that a flock of birds can fly higher and faster by flying in one another's slipstreams and rotating through when the front bird gets tired. Each flock mate is aligned with and responsive to their closest flock mates. There's a strong sense of community and um, creative identity, and at the same time, there's diversity. So each individual has enough space to make their own unique contribution, and each unique contribution is valued. So on the basis of this, I decided to do some social network analysis of some of my, uh, my case study participants. So what I did was I mapped the working relationships of, of some of my outstanding creatives. So the graphic shows a simplified uh, social network diagram for, for one of my participants. I'm about to give you a crash course in social network analysis. Are you ready? <laughs> okay, so um, my participant is the blue blob in the middle. Um, so, unpacking this. First of all, my participants tended to maintain a limited number of very close, strong, um, unidisciplinary ties. So people from the same discipline who, who co-created with that person um, became a powerhouse of sorts to ensure that there's a critical mass behind an idea and that the creative idea is brought to fruition. So that's the first type of unidisciplinary tie that seemed to be very important. Second type is um, a variety of weak or indirect ties. So these are the acquaintances or secondary contacts that an individual maintains. Um, strong ties tend to require significant upkeep because they're, they're very strong, close relationships. So what the participants in my study tended to do was maintain um, a diverse range of um, indirect or, or weak ties that they were able to draw upon and transmute if required. So, for instance, if I want to collaborate with a 3D modeler on my next project, I don't know them very well now, but I know where to find one later on. This seemed to be a, a very important element in innovation. And the third type of tie, which I, I found in the social networks of my participants was the transdisciplinary ties. Now this is where it gets really interesting. Um, this seemed to be the basis of a lot of the really innovative work that they were doing. So several participants adopted what is known in social network analysis terms as a brokerage role between different networks. So um, this is in keeping with Bert's suggestions about the optimal conditions for innovation. So, my innovative participants actually occupied what's known as a structural hole between um, disciplinary, disconnected disciplinary networks. Um, and information was able to, to pass between them, new ideas, and they were in, able to synthesise new knowledge and innovate um, through synthesising disparate forms of, of knowledge. Not only is it unusual for individuals to, to pursue these sorts of transdisciplinary ties in their work, it's even more unusual for them to pursue 
unidisciplinary and transdisciplinary ties concurrently. Now this seems to be um, the, the, the driving force between successful innovation among many of my participants. So in this way, they were able to come up with really creative, really interesting ideas through their transdisciplinary ties and sometimes through their unidisciplinary ties. And then they were able to um, use the powerhouse of strong unidisciplinary ties to get that innovative idea out there. So in the words of my participants, So that was social networking capability. Let's talk a little bit more about transdisciplinarity. So transdisciplinary capability, I'm talking here about the individual capability rather than the networked capability that I just talked about. So transdisciplinarity um, is a term that I choose to use rather than multidisciplinarity or interdisciplinarity because it actually involves synthesis of disparate knowledge sets, um, integration and synthesis. So, Transdisciplinarity as a concept is getting increasingly um, in currency in, in STEM disciplines as an essential approach to solving complex problems in the 21st century. Um, it's starting to be recognised that you know, it's very difficult to, to solve a complex social problem just from a, a unidisciplinary perspective. I don't know if you saw um, this image in the popular media in the last week at all. Yeah, it, it was around around a lot. Um, this image is a screenshot from a game called Fold It. And um, it, it hit the popular media last week because um, University of Washington researchers published a study in Nature in which um, they were looking at um, a collaboration between scientists and gamers. What the scientists at the University of Washington wanted to do was um, discover the, uh, the structure of a particular protein which is um, produced by an AIDS-like virus in monkeys. Um, and they'd struggled with this issue for the last decade th using traditional methods. Then they brought the gamers in and this folded game and the gamers were able to solve this problem in 10 days. So yeah, this is, this is an example of um, collaborative problem solving, transdisciplinary problem solving in action. But what was really interesting to me wasn't so much about the, the, the collaborative transdisciplinarity, that, that was pretty interesting. But when I dug deeper, I found that the scientists had actually created this game. So they were scientists with gaming backgrounds who were able to look at um, the problem and say, hang on, this lends itself to um, a gaming um, visual problem solving kind of approach. Let's design a game, send it out there, crowdsource it and get several thousand gamers to work on it. And it worked. But it's also becoming clear that these kinds of mechanisms work in creative disciplines as well. So it seems that um, using knowledge and perspectives from multiple disciplines can be combined in novel ways to, to produce something that's truly innovative. So a majority of the participants in my study had um, quite diverse disciplinary backgrounds. I've shown some of them up here on the screen. Um, still more of them had multiple sub-disciplinary backgrounds. So for instance, um, within the performing arts, uh, one of my participants had a background in choreography, in theatre direction and also in music and he was able to, to draw on these. Uh, these skill sets. The transdisciplinarity involves more than just multiple skill sets. It actually involves um, epistemological and, and cultural agility. It requires um, an ability to create new dialects and translate across disciplinary boundaries. So it's actually quite a high level kind of capability. Okay, so that was transdisciplinarity. Entrepreneurship, the third and final one. Okay, when I, I talk with some people about entrepreneurship, particularly from arts disciplines, I, I get um, looks and I get responses, so I'm going to, to address this up front. I'm not talking about entrepreneurship in this sense. Um, 
Actually, my very recent work is about uh, what creative entrepreneurship entails and how it's different from, from business entrepreneurship. There are several fundamental differences here, but perhaps the most important one, of course, is that um, entrepreneurs uh, like Richard and Steve here uh, tend to be pulled to, to being entrepreneurial. They're driven by the challenge, by um, creating a new product, by, by commercial success and this type of thing. Whereas uh, creative entrepreneurship often involves uh, much more complex kinds of drivers, uh, which may or may not be commercial in nature. So I'll talk more about those, um, those bottom lines, those creative bottom lines, more in just a second. I am talking about entrepreneurship in, uh, if those of you who are familiar with, with Schumpeter and Drucker, I'm, I'm talking about this, this kind of sense of entrepreneurship. So, this idea of opportunity recognition and then value adding of some sort. I'm talking about um, this very high level ability to pick up patterns in the creative's context, their, their environment, um, collaborator availability, resources, distinctive patterns, identify them as potential opportunities and then turn that into um, creating some kind of value. So the value add here can be commercial, but it needn't be. Um, triple bottom line theory from social entrepreneurship um, starts to acknowledge that entrepreneurship can actually be concerned with multiple or multiple, even multiple concurrent bottom lines, which is something that, that creatives are, are very familiar with, I would think. Um, and then, of course, Hawke's added cultural aims to triple bottom line theory. And then my own research with creatives back in 2007, I explored the various kinds of value that professional creatives like to add through their work, and I added a few more bottom lines. So sometimes these bottom lines, these entrepreneurial bottom lines, can be congruent with one another, and sometimes they're in conflict. Anyone who's ever run a multiple stakeholder project will know what I mean. Um, Everybody has their own expectations and they, they need to be managed. But also this happens at the, the individual identity level in the creative. So my point here with creative entrepreneurship and my participants is that participants in my study were very good at juggling multiple bottom lines in entrepreneurship. They were very good at identifying multiple ways of adding value, identifying opportunities which maximised that value. They're also very good at juggling multiple identities to do with making, creating, and entrepreneurship, arguably quite different functions. Switching mindsets as needed. And I've already talked about the pursuit of both union transdisciplinary ties and ways of thinking in order to engender innovation. So they seem to be particularly good at managing and negotiating potentially dissonant um, ways of being, mindsets, um, situations. Okay, so to take it back here, during my experiences in rooms like this, there was very little emphasis on things like entrepreneurship, on creative, um, collaborative creativity, on transdisciplinarity, um, concepts like this. However, I know that when I did my research for this keynote and I, I looked at websites like this one, there are quite a few case studies on, on this website and there, there are also quite a few instances in the program today of um, multidisciplinary studio work, work that creates connections between um, students and, um, and the industry, connections between students within programs. That's, that's the stuff that I'm really interested in. Um, and going through the day, I'd be really keen to, to have a chat with you all about how you engender these kinds of capabilities through your studio work and your studio experiences. Um, thank you very much.